So with Overkill's The Walking Dead being fully released in a couple of weeks, we finally got access to the beta to get a better understanding of how the game is going to look, feel and play. And if you're like me and saw the pre-beta footage, you might be on the fence whether or not to consider purchasing. After all, the jokes for the last five years that it'll be Payday 2 Zombie Edition, and from what little we had seen up until this point, that was pretty much the case. But now that the beta is out, and I've had a chance to play it, how's it play, is it fun, and most importantly, is it worth 60 US dollars? The first thing you'll notice when you boot up the game are the beautiful cinematics the game presents you with. These are most likely produced by Goodbye Kansas, the studio in charge of making the four cinematic character trailers. They are really fantastic quality, and you can't really knock them. Next, you'll most likely go to change settings and key bindings, but currently you're extremely restricted in the beta, so double check this when the game actually comes out. So moving straight into the game, the menu gives you two options, map and character. Map is where you'll select missions and expeditions as one would expect, and character is where you select who you want to play as, as each character will have their unique weapon proficiencies, ability and class. There are four classes in the game, Aiden is the tank, Heather is the scout, Grant is the tactician, and Maya is the support. Overkill have stated that there will be two extra playable characters on release, and one, if not both, have to be Payday characters. My guess is that it'll either be Dallas or Chains. As for what class they'll be, Dallas would fit well as a tactician, and Chains would fit the tank. I'll talk more about the classes in the game later. Since The Walking Dead is all about that narrative, the game is going to progress in a structure similar to the TV show and other Walking Dead IPs, meaning there will be seasons and episodes. Season 1 is going to be fully released all at once, and there will be 10 story missions, which will act as the episodes, as well as a series of expedition missions. Season 2 will have 9 episodes and will be released sporadically from the end of November all the way through to June of 2019, which will mean about one new episode every month or so, and anyone that buys the game will have access to all two seasons. The game starts out with the first story mission called The First Shot, in which the family, Season 1's main antagonist, send a horde of walkers to our camp and we have to defend and repair our gates. It's a good beginner mission as it gives the player free range to experiment with how the game feels and how the guns and the shooting handle, as well as the damage and health systems. You have to defend four waves of walkers and repair each of the three entrances with planks, which dynamically scale with the amount of players in the game. After you successfully complete the first mission, you'll get access to three more tabs in the menu, Camp Upgrades, Vault, and Lost and Found and the ability to visit your Georgetown camp. At camp, there are a few things you can do. You can talk to Anderson and get rewards for completing story missions, and a bit later you can get bounties from him, which act as daily challenges. Anderson is the team coordinator, similar to Bane and Locke in Payday 2. You're able to access Peggy Ann here, who is a shopkeeper where you can purchase weapons and modifications. And Caleb is here. He is our getaway driver, and whatever he does at the camp, we don't have access to yet. Back in the menu, you'll notice that the next mission is locked. In order to access it, you'll need to familiarize yourself with the camp upgrades. This is one of the multiple progression systems in the game, and ties in heavily with the others. The camp has five trees and three tiers. The hub, the depot, the range, the radio, and the clinic. And each, excluding the hub, specialize in one of the four different classes. Each tree has three branches, survivor, workstation, and tool, as well as unlocking a range of skills for playable characters. The survivor's branch unlocks benefits for survivor missions, which I'll touch on later. The workstation improves survivor missions and or camp features, and tools will unlock new items that you can take on missions. In order to unlock these upgrades, you'll need to have enough supplies. The three main supplies are scrap, provision, and equipment. The interesting part of the camp is that every three days, you'll have to pay upkeep with those three supplies. Failing to do so results in bad things that you don't want to experience. There are also blueprints, which are a scarce resource, which are required to unlock the tier three upgrades in the camp. You can obtain them by handing in five bounties during high-end survivor missions, and I believe leveling up past the level cap, which in the beta was level 10, but on release will be level 30. There is also medicine, 
upkeep timer, and the amount of survivors in your camp, and your camp morale, which I'll touch on later as well. So in order to continue unlocking story missions, you'll need to upgrade the root branch in the hub. The second story mission, Hell or High Water, is the first proper mission that introduces the core game mechanics to the player. The most important is the Hordometer, illustrated in the top middle of the screen. This indicates your current Horde level, 0 through to 3, and will have major effects on the game, with how many walkers you'll have to deal with. Needless to say, at zero, you won't have to deal with that many zombies. And this is ideally where you want to keep it for the majority of the mission. However, there are multiple hazards that will increase the horde level. Any loud sounds, like a car alarm, shotgun and sound traps, and of course, shooting unsilenced weapons. This will be the main cause of the horde level increasing, as you will regularly encounter sections in missions with humans. And as everyone should know, humans are the true threat in the Walking Dead series. So far, every human section I've encountered in the beta could be stealthable, and this is the ideal way to approach these sections, since if you can take enemies out silently, your horde level won't increase. Otherwise, you're going to want to take them out as quickly as possible to reduce the amount of gunfire that occurs as your horde level will increase rapidly. This will make the rest of the mission harder globally. Getting to Horde Level 3 makes the game extremely challenging as you will get massive amounts of zombies, making progressing incredibly difficult. To make things harder, whilst you can suppress weapons for taking out people silently, suppressors have a limited amount of durability each mission, meaning that you will only get a set number of silent shots for taking out humans. Once you get through the majority of the mission and grab whatever item that we were after, you shoot a flare to signal Caleb our escape driver for extraction. Shooting the flare will round up your horde level to the next nearest one. So if you're at level two, you'll get the full horde level three. This means you can never finish a mission with zero horde level. The best you can do is horde level one. You'll have to wait for Caleb to arrive and then take whatever items you have and secure them in his truck. Throughout missions, you can also find extra loot. Weapon and modifications will be locked in a crate which will require one of the many tools you can bring. From my experience, the lock type is always something that is carried by you or your teammates, so you should always be able to collect them, as long as you can find them. You can also find survivors which you'll have to escort to the escape area. You can check at the start of the mission briefing screen exactly what you can find. Question mark boxes will usually be weapons, and the other icon is modifications. If the icon has an illumination around it, that means you will get this for completing the mission. If it isn't, that means it's findable loot. The illumination color will also tell you what rarity the item will be. The higher the difficulty you play on, the higher the rarity of items you get. Currently, the known rarities are, in order, orange is salvaged, White is common, green uncommon, blue rare, and purple is high end. Apart from being generally better, rarity indicates how many attachments can be put on the weapon, with common having one, uncommon having two, and rare and high end having three. The attachment that can be put on each gun is random, so if you get a common sniper with a scope attachment slot, you won't be able to put on a barrel extension, like a silencer on it. Weapons will also have a combat rating, which serves to help identify which weapons are more powerful and will increase your global combat rating, which as far as I understand is only there to help identify to players where they should be for certain difficulties. Hard difficulty says you should have a combat rating of 85. It won't stop you from playing hard, but it just serves to warn you that you may be under equipped and under leveled. After you have completed the second story mission and handed it in to Anderson, you'll get access to a new tab in the menu, Survivors. This is one of the other main progression systems. Depending on the level of your hub, you can have 10, 20 or 40 survivors in your camp, and the amount of survivors won't affect the upkeep cost, only the hub level increases that. Survivors are useful for a number of reasons, however, each survivor, just like the playable characters, has one of the four classes. Tank, Scout, Tactician, and Support, and each has their own level. You level up survivors by sending them out on missions. Missions are essentially little side quests that cost supplies to run, 
and as a result, you can get supplies back, weapons, modifications, blueprints, as well as giving survivors experience to level up. Mission success is affected by the class of the survivor that embarks on it, as well as their level and what the other classes are accompanying them. Camp morale also plays a factor. Every survivor mission will also indicate how much experience it gives, as well as how many days it will take to complete. Remember that every completed mission that you do counts as a day. The downside is that if you fail, your survivors have a chance of getting injured. If this happens, you will have to use your medicine to heal them. You will have a time limit in order to heal them. Failing to do so will cause survivors to fall into the dying state, which there is no recovery, and will eventually die. Survivors can also be killed by raids on the camp by the family. The main reason you want to level up survivors is for the workstation. The workstation is where you can put survivors to operate, and depending on the experience level of the workstations, you will receive different buffs to your playable character throughout missions. The higher the survivor level, the more they fill up the workstation bar. They will also give extra if they are the same class type as the workstation they are in. Conversely, injured survivors contribute less. The workstation bonuses are pretty great, from starting with more crafting materials to being able to recover your two last bars of health. They are certainly worth attaining. From my experience in the beta, a level 8 survivor in the correct class workstation can max one bar, so you'd need about four level 6 survivors to max each workstation, and you'll need to upgrade each workstation in the camp upgrades in order to put more survivors in them. Each camp upgrade will also unlock the higher tiers of your character abilities. Characters have two skill areas, character abilities and core abilities. The core abilities are generic skills that all survivors will be able to unlock and are split into four sections related to the camp upgrades. The range deals with weapons, the clinic with health, the depot with stamina, and the radio is crafting. On top of that, each character has specific character abilities, which will unlock with the corresponding class. For example, Aiden is a tank class, and his specific abilities will unlock as you upgrade the depot. The character abilities are unique and are split into three trees. A throwable deployable, like a flashbang or a medic bag, and locking the top of this tree lets other characters use it, similar to teachable skills in Dead by Daylight. Then you have a specific ability, which is either passive or active. Aiden gets damage reduction after being hit, whilst Grant can highlight targets for more damage. Then finally, your primary, secondary, and melee weapon proficiencies. Again, Aiden uses shotguns and baseball bats, Heather is crossbows, Grant is quarter staffs, etc. Other useful information, the full version of the game will be around 60 gigs, so you're going to want to make sure you have enough hard drive space for it. Also keep in mind that this is all information I've gathered from the beta, there could be a lot more stuff, and some things might change in the full release. But this I felt was a good idea to showcase what the game had to offer. So there does seem like there's a lot to do, but is it worth $60? Well, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Consider subscribing, also Twitch, later, love you.